We're here at the Cuss Sculpture Foundation to speak to Jennifer Wen Ma about her new commission, Mola, for a group show of contemporary Chinese sculpture, A Beautiful Disorder. This exhibition, A Beautiful Disorder, marks the first time that the Cuss Sculpture Foundation has commissioned works from Chinese sculptors. It's also the first major exhibition of outdoor sculpture shown here in the UK by Chinese artists. You've created a new site, or you're creating, in fact, a new site-specific work for the exhibition. So can you tell us a bit about the work and what it signifies and how you're making it? Mm -hmm. I'm making a piece called Molar, and it's a, fairly, a little bit complex piece that involves several parts. We first have a chandelier. We have 400 plus glass pieces that's hanging in from the ceiling, from the skylight, and around it are these black leaves. So it almost looks like a capsized tree or branch, a very large branch, and that's putting forth this um, crystal-like fruit, cluster of fruit. And the, the shapes of the fruit are referencing a lot of bodily elements, from teardrops to blood drops to perfect cells to womb-like um, breasts and butts to sperm and um, cells and cancer cells. So it's all these different things kind of relate to the body. And it's kind of about even if a fruit, if, if uh, vegetation puts forth different kinds of fruit, good or bad, however we call it, they can all be a source for inspiration for the next step going forward. And then underneath this um, fruit, this tree, we have a reflection pool of black ink. Um, you can walk onto the pool, we have a platform, so you can be close to it, you can be surrounded. This music is me playing a music box. I made the score on a piece of paper and fed it through a music box and playing it and recorded it. So it's a little, like, a little bit like a lullaby and it's a song from my childhood, just about how the mountains, the landscape has so much emotions for us. I thought it would be quite an apropos soundtrack to this little piece of paradise or disintegrating paradise that we have here. Around the pool, there are 17 panels of painting of this landscape. But the landscape is kind of coming apart. It's almost disintegrating. Again, echoing the idea of um, the strength of the nature and parts are disintegrating. And it's creating this border, this boundary that blurs the line so you can look inside of it and outside of it because it's painted on glass. And it's also reflective, so parts of it you can see yourself in it. So it's really meant as a place of reflection in this mm, utopia that's maybe disintegrating just a little bit. And these are the panels that you're painting here now? Yeah, um, today I'm making the panel paintings, 17 panels. Um, they're 2.44 meters high. 1.22 meters wide, um, Chinese ink onto the glass, and then I spray it with different types of um, um, fixatives and color. There will be a mirror effect, so that create that um, reflection, but also um, almost like a weathered mirror look. So this almost must mirage coming out, emerging out of the landscape. And what's the significance of the ink for you? I've been working with ink for a number of years now. Um, it's a very simple material. It's essentially charcoal, ground soot with water and some kind of animal binding. And it's been used in East Asian um, culture for communication for centuries. Um, but it's also the black is so rich. It's a culmination of all colors. Black is also the lack of light. So there's this um, duality of inclusion and exposure in one. I feel like it has a lot of room for exploration and imagination. And in this way, I'm painting landscape painting with ink, but in a completely different method on glass and also creating this boundary, inner and outer universe. So traditional painters of landscape painting would create that if you open a scroll all of a sudden, from the outside, you're looking in. So I'm creating a different kind of inner and outer universe. It's an experiment. <laughs> and bringing the audience in, and like literally you say, there'll be a platform that they can walk across. That's quite common to your work as well, to include participation. You, yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. Um, there's quite a few works. It's about, there's a look on the outside in, like the exterior, and then 
an invitation to enter once you're inside is a different type of experience. Um, it's interesting, I've been dealing with this idea of paradise. Um, the word paradise actually comes from a very old Iranian term. It means walled enclosure. So there's this idea that paradise needs to be enclosed. It's meant to keep certain things out and certain things in. But I think throughout history, humans have been trying to break into or out of a paradise or a utopia. So this idea is very rich. Um, so I think I've been meditating on this for quite a long time. It's quite relevant actually to the sculpture park here with the wall all around it as well. Yeah, I think the history of this place is so interesting. It's from Mr. and Mrs. Cass and their love for sculpture, creating this as first for themselves and then for their friends and then now for you know this open invitation to the public and also the larger art world um, going outside of Britain, going to China. I'm sure they'll be doing lots of exciting programs in the future. So I think it's kind of a, also a parallel of the story of this park as well, of this um, Cass Sculpture Foundation. And you mentioned paradise and the title of the show is A Beautiful Disorder, which I know comes from a letter by a Jesuit missionary um, talking about Chinese garden style as opposed to English garden style, which is quite sort of specific and rigid. And then the Chinese one was a lot freer and well, a beautiful disorder, in fact. Mm -hmm. So how much specifically have you responded or borne that in mind? Quite a lot. Um, actually, when I designed the piece, I came here in last June um, to do a site visit to see the grounds. I went to gardens around. So I went to Westing Gardens, which is just so breathtakingly beautiful, majestic, the colors, the forms, and very different in style. So the platform, we don't have a very large pond, um, large area to design, but I did try to create a little bit of geometric and as well as organic. So there's a one platform that's very rectangular and another part of it that you look out from and then it goes into a more organic form. So that actually came, that idea came to me um, specifically after my site visit here. So this idea of merging the two organically, but also taking different inspirations as something I tried to incorporate in my work. In fact, when we're painting this, um, I had some preconceived idea, like I did a composition before I came on small paper, so we'll be prepared, but I've redone the entire thing since I've been here. Also these trees, um, so a lot of the paintings, the trees on the edges um, echoed the really tall um, vertical trees that you find around this area, particularly in this park, that's really beautiful um, qualities. So I reconfigure that in the painting itself as well. Is a lot of your work site specific? A lot of it, and I really enjoy. Um, as an artist, you have a practice, you have a train of thought, you're following, you're exploring and looking, digging deeper. But I find that if there's a great show, great invitation such as this, beautiful site, um, really interesting idea and great people to work with, then you can find some really interesting intersections that opens the work up even more. So um, I'm really grateful. I think this work has taught me, this process of making it has taught me a lot and it gives me even more possibilities and different avenues to explore after this is done. You've been involved with a lot of different projects. So you were one of the um, seven members of the core creative team for the Beijing Olympics, as well as being the chief designer for visual and special effects. How did that come about? There was a call, oh, international call, that the Olympic Organizing Committee put out in 2005. So there were um, a dozen artists out of um, New York. A lot of them are Chinese and not all. We put together a proposal, especially a led by me and another artist. And when we made the bid, um, we were selected. There were like 500, I think, 500, five or 600 different bids internationally. And we made it into the finals of 13 and made a presentation to the officials there. And then they um, chose key artists out of each team to create this core creative team. So that's kind of how I got involved and then worked on it for two and a half years. Gosh, that's a big commitment. Yeah. <laughs> and you're based now in New York and Beijing And as Beijing, well? yeah, I have a studio in Beijing as well. Do you split your time equally? No, I, I'm more in New York, um, but I do a lot of production, a lot of pieces, 
parts of this came from um, Beijing, and I go there um, seasonally to spend time working on projects and uh, take care of studio work. Is the work that you make there noticeably different from the work that you No, it's not really. Yeah, it's a continuation. But because the work are very site specific and responding to the need, the curatorial call, so the work could be quite different, but mm, I'm not sure if it's really bound geographically so much. And what made you leave China in the first place to go to New York? Um, I left China when I was quite young. I was 12. So my family uh, immigrated to the U.S. And we live in Oklahoma, not New York. But um, then I went to New York for art school. And then I, I think in two, around 2001, I started going back to China more regularly for work or project-based things. Mm, a little more, at least but really moving back to Beijing in 2006, 2007 for two and a half years to work on the Olympics. And that was really my first experience working in China, like living and working there, because I left so young. And is it